Um, and one of the great things about Lois is that by design and by uh, profession, she's an outsider. You know, so she's always in an observational role. And, you know, a character who tells truth to power, when power in the context of her universe is literally Superman. Uh, I mean, come on, man. Hey, if you can't make a meal out of that, you're doing something wrong. Hello, everyone. We are with Greg Rucka, four-time Eisner Award winner and one-time Harvey Award winner and also one-time winner of the GLAAD Award. So hi there, Mr. Rucka. Hi, how are you? I'm doing all right. Um, I'm just going to go right down to my, to my yeah, first let's, question. Let's jump right in. I'm going to name some protagonists that you've written. Okay. Uh, Carrie Stetko from Whiteout, uh, Tara from Queen and Country, Jessica Midnight, uh, Forever for a Name Toya, As the Question, Rowan Black, Sasha Bordeaux, The Huntress, Electra, Kate Kane, Rachel Cole Alves, Lady Saber, Wonder Woman, Dex Harios, Lois Lane, and Andy of Scythia from The Old Guard. I'm noticing a pattern here. What is it about women that draws you to write them? Um, that is a multi-part answer. Um, there is a basic part, which is I like them. Um, and I like writing about women. Uh, there is a part of that answer that says the female protagonist has been underserved and for generations been horribly treated and mishandled and um and overly simplified and been treated as a guy with tits and the list goes on and on um there's a dramatic uh dividend answer which is that you can take almost any dramatic situation uh, and most of these, especially in superhero comics, we've seen a million times before, and it becomes something different if the protagonist is not, you know, your standard character, i.e. a white male, um, but is somebody else, be that a person of color, be that a woman, um, you know, the list goes on and on. And that works only if you... Um, that, that, that only works if you are writing your characters with the appropriate respect and, um, and, 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 and integrity. And, and that comes from a place of research. Um, you know, I am a character writer. Um, I don't really write from plot. I, 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 I encounter characters and then the characters tell me what their story is. And if every character is different, then you can tell the same story eight times with a different character and you're going to get a different story because they're going to act differently. Andy isn't forever. Forever isn't Dex. Dex isn't Lois. You know, and the list goes on and on. So... You know, I mean, I, I, I'm painfully aware that I'm primarily known for writing, quote, strong women characters, end quote. And I guess I am. Because um, I guess that's what people mostly know me for doing. I've got... It, I honestly me. didn't even notice until around the fourth book of yours that I, that I read. Yeah, I mean, look... Look at the novels, right? I mean, the Kodiak series, male protagonist. Uh, the Jad Bell series, male protagonist. But, you know, these are novels, and the comics community crossover there is limited. And then the Queen and Country series is obviously a Tara Chase series. So, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. There's no real simple answer. So, 
you know, to, to, to honor the question is to say, it's all of these things and, and whatever else you want to imagine. Um, I seem to do it pretty well. And I think that my confidence and willingness to engage in the challenges of, you know, writing from any character has served me well. Um, and gender is only an element of character. It isn't the sole defining trait of a character. So. The history of, uh, well, not just comics, but also fiction. Why do you think it's been so difficult for people to write? Uh, convincing women. I, I don't want to say strong and powerful women, but just convincing women, considering we all have women in our lives and they take up 50% of the population. Well, I, I think it probably comes from a couple places, but one of those is that the majority of these stories have been written by guys and they've been written by white guys of a certain era and a certain age and they never needed to engage. And they never really wanted to give it its, its, its due consideration. Um, that's not to say, I mean, I didn't invent the wheel and I don't ever want to claim credit for having done something that, you know, others had done before. I think the thing that made my, you know, we're going back now over 20 years for me, but I think that the thing that made my entry into comics noteworthy at the time wasn't simply that Whiteout was a completely different type of comic than anything else that was available at that time. It wasn't simply that it was a murder mystery. It wasn't simply that it was in black and white. It wasn't simply that it was drawn by Steve Lieber. It wasn't simply that it was set in Antarctica, but it was also the fact that the protagonist was a woman and was a woman who looked like a woman and acted like a woman. Um, and, you know, wasn't all tits and ass. Um, and I think for, you know, given the moment that that book entered, that was sort of a revelatory experience for some people. Um, never mind the fact that if you're setting something in Antarctica, you know, people are wearing parkas. You're not going to see a whole lot of curves. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, it, it, it's, I don't know, you know, I mean... Yeah. It isn't something I fell into. It was a deliberate choice. There was a very specific moment when I went from going, I, I want a female protagonist to, I have to be able to do this properly. And that meant for me, actually, an awful lot of hard work, you know, talking to the women I knew, asking questions about and being aware of um, gender in society and, and specifically within my frame of experience, which is uh, gender in American society. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I think one would argue that one of the reasons, one of the reasons a vast majority of portrayals have failed is because that just has never been considered. You know, that writers just, just would sort of brush past um, the, the, the gender issue, or they would be lazy with the gender issue. And I'm many things, but I'm not lazy with my characters. I tend to be pretty, pretty rigid and, 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 and thorough with them. So. Yeah, you have pretty strong characterization for, for pretty much all mm -hmm. of your characters. Um, having said that, the last comic series that you finished was Lois Lane. Yeah. And I loved it with, uh, oh, my, with Mike you. Perkins. Yeah. I've Perch heard he's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's another one of those guys who I've read so many works of. And I guess his, maybe his name doesn't register because it's always like such a great story. Yeah. He, he doesn't seem to get uh, enough uh, sunshine as I think he should. He is a remarkable storyteller. Um, and, and, a delight to collaborate with I have to say just wonderful to work with so but you were saying yes I, there was a question there sorry actually I will get back to that later but I've heard you say once before that when written properly Lois Lane is the best fictional character I think it was on word balloon Did yeah I mean I think I think certainly in the DC universe if 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 you really engage with who Lois is she is the perfect gateway character to the entirety of the DC universe. 
And one of the things that I've always, and I think one of the things you get in my superhero work in particular, is I'm not terribly interested in the super of the heroes. Um, I am far more interested in what it looks like to be outside that and to see them. I mean, I think really the sole example consistently has been Diana, but that's because Wonder Woman just fascinates me. I think there's so much there that you could, you could write a thousand Wonder Woman stories and, <clears throat> and not exhaust it. Um, you know, and, and one of the great things about Lois is that by design and by uh, profession, she's an outsider. You know, so she's always in an observational role. And, you know, a character who tells truth to power, when power in the context of her universe is literally Superman, uh, I mean, come on, man. Hey, if you can't make a meal out of that, you're doing something wrong. What's it like writing a character like Lois Lane, a journalist, um, in the year 2020? Uh, yeah, that was, well, I mean, it, in a lot of ways, that's what those 12 issues are about, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there was a reason Clark Kent, when he got to Metropolis, wanted to be a journalist, you know? It is, uh, at its best, a vital and, 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 and noble profession. Uh, and it is significant that every authoritarian power, the first thing they do is they go after the journalists. They want their populace to not know the truth. And they want to stifle criticism. And what a free press does is criticize. A free press says, this is what is going on. And it doesn't criticize. That's an editorial right? This isn't an opinion piece. A reporter reports. So if a reporter is reporting on a story that says, oh, this bad thing happened, they're not making it up, <laughs> right? They're reporting on it. And if you don't like being called on it, that's, you know, th then you've got a problem with the free press. And, um, you know, I'm living in a country that has been waging war on journalism for easily 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that in the last, you know, four, certainly 12, arguably, ramped up the attacks to open warfare. And now we have, you know, uh, a criminal and a treasonous, you know, con man in the White House. And of course, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to, you know, the joke, you know, what are you going to believe, you know, me or your lying eyes? And, you know, that that's the name of the game. The name of the game is to say, don't listen to them. And the way we do that is we say they're not to be trusted. They're the lying media. So all of a sudden, facts don't matter. So when you're writing the lowest story in that era, you know, it is important it was important to me, to all other things going on in the story, it be clear that I wanted to show, look, one of the conceits of the DC universe is the, there are certain things you accept. And one of the things, you, you know, you accept Superman can fly. Yeah. You accept that, you know, the Batmobile never gets stuck in traffic. <laughs> and you accept that Lois Lane is a great reporter. The best so reporter. That, yeah, so that meant that it wasn't a question of trying to find the story that she was reporting on. It was a question of trying to illustrate why she is and why journalism is so important, right? So it became, in, in, in ways, I think, um, an illumination of what good journalism looks like and a defense of it. But we decided very early on, before I started writing, you know, Perkins and I and the editor at that time was Mike Cotton, had a discussion about the fact that there is nothing more boring in a comic book than turning the page and all of a sudden there's a thousand words of prose mm -hmm. in the middle. I mean, it just, it, it's like punching the reader in the face. And I didn't ever want the audience to be reading what Lois was writing because it's a comic book. It's not a prose piece. It's a comic book. So it was important that we could show, we, we showed everything but the writing, right? 
you saw her doing the writing, but you never read it. You, oh, saw never, the yeah. you, you saw the effects of the journalism and you saw the work to get to the journalism, right? But you never actually read, you know, scandalous claims by the White House by Lois Lane, right? Because that would have been dull. And frankly, I wouldn't have wanted to write that because I'm not a journalist. What I am is I'm a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're asking me to pretend to do something that people have spent decades honing their craft at. And I'm like, that's not where my skill set lies, folks. My skill set lies in making you think that you read what Lois wrote. So Lois Lane reads uh, like a love letter to the entirety of your DC work. Basically, just everything you've done has almost everything you've done has been in there, including the multiverse. Yeah. And uh, Renee Montoya, uh, Jessica yeah. Midnight. The multiverse was reintroduced in 52. You were a big part of that. Yeah. There were, f there were four of you. Um, and I think one of the things- well, actually five, because you got to count Keith. Okay, there were five of you, that's true. I... Keith, Keith Giffen gets lost out, left out because everybody goes, oh, there was Rucka, there was Jeff Johns, there was Mark Wade, there was Grant Morrison. And then they did the layouts. Well, and Keith, Keith, Keith had an influence on story. I mean, a lot of the question stuff I ended up doing in 52 came out of working with Keith. You know? Great. That was actually my next question. Like, what was that working experience like? Because I imagine it was different for, from every other working experience you've ever had. Yeah. Do you I have mean, any was... funny stories about it? <laughs> Jesus. Do I have any funny stories? Um, it was a long time ago, so let's get that clear, right? <laughs> You're asking me about something that's yeah. 13, 14 years old. It was incredibly difficult. Um, it was a year and a half of a sprint. Um, there, there was never, there was never an easy week until really the end when everything fell into place. Um, that said, I haven't talked about it in a long time, so I'm trying to figure out how my opinions on it may have changed, and I'm not sure. I mean, it was incredibly rewarding, but man, it was hard. Weekly. Man, it was hard. Yeah, well, and, and not only weekly, because it would have been different if there were only two of us doing it weekly. At least you knew. But there were, you know, four or five of us juggling stories, and you would, we would have a call, you know, like every... Tuesday, I think, I can't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, we'd have a call to discuss what needed to be written. You know, we were always X many weeks ahead and trying to solve story problems and who was getting what pages in this issue and which plots were being serviced. You know, I had written out in the initial meetings, I had had this long um, document that basically had every week an A plot, B plot, C plot, and D plot. And who was doing what in each issue and you would follow it through. So there would be stretches where, you know, I'd have two weeks where I only had to write four pages total. And then the next three weeks, it would be eight pages in each issue. And any writer will tell you that writing short is much harder than writing long. Um, you know, if you tell me you've got 20 pages, I'm like, great, that's room to move. You tell me I have two. That's not a lot of wiggle room right? The efficiency required is extraordinary. So, you know, and, and, and learning from people in particular like Mark Wade, uh, who is a master of efficiency, you know, in comic storytelling, was enormously rewarding. But, you know, you asked me for a funny story, and honestly, I'm trying to think of, like, something really funny that happened. And I'm... Um, I'm not coming up with anything right <laughs> now. There was a very interesting, I remember at one point we, we had an issue where Jeff and Mark were adamant that the issue was going to end with, then you would turn the page and it would jump to week 40. And this is like in week 18. And I remember being in that meeting and saying, we can't do that. We cannot do that. You can't do that. And they were like, but it'd be so cool. And I'm like, I don't care how cool it is. 
we have set rules that violates them. And they were like, well, you're wrong. And Wacker, I think, was the editor at that time. And he was like, you're wrong. And they went ahead and they wrote it and it made it to the DO. And he sent it right back saying, what the hell is this? You're breaking your own premise. You can't do that. And I was like, Ding. I was the rules guy. I was, I was the guy who was like, no, 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 no. We said this, we have to stick to this or whatnot. So yeah, I was clearly very popular. He said sarcastically. Uh, how important is it for writers to set constraints and to stick to them? Well, if, if I don't have, you know, the, the, you have to set rules, right? If, if, if you do not have some manner of rules within the story, then, then literally there is no framework of expectation. So, you know, and, and the conceit of 52 specifically was, each issue is a week in the life of this year of the DC universe when Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman have all gone on vacation, basically. So that, I mean, that's the premise of the book. It's in the title. And you cannot then turn around and be like, I am suddenly violating that, right? It's cheating. It's literally cheating. I, I don't... Um, yeah, I mean, you can't, I'll give you an example. You're watching Pacific Rim, yeah. right? And there's Kaiju and there's the Jaegers and they're slugging it out. And, uh, in the middle of that movie, uh, it suddenly dovetails into, uh, you know, an analysis of, um, the building of uh, Charles, you know, Foster Kane's uh, media empire. And you're going to be going, what? Right? That's not, or another example in that the movie. The movie turns into black and white. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'll give you, an, I'll give you another example, just because that's the one that pops in my head for no reason. I don't know why I went there, but um, the movie talks about drifting and being drift compatible. Okay. Yeah. Without that established in the text, you cannot quote drift with the uh, with the kaiju, right? You cannot do it, right? So the movie gives you the rules, says this is what you do, this is what drifting is, and then to make the story go, a character has to drift with a kaiju, and for that to have jeopardy, everybody has to be able to say, "Oh my God, you can't do that." And the reason that works, the reason there's jeopardy is because the rule was established, right? Mm -hmm. The rule was established. We understand what drifting is. We understand the dangers of it. We understand why what's being suggested is crazy and dangerous, right? And ding, that's how you get to the next thing. So you establish the rule in that case because you know you're going to violate it, right? Um, if there had been no discussing of drifting and the dangers of drifting, the immediate question would have been, why didn't they do that years ago? Moving back a couple of years. <laughs> like, you got a limited time. We got to get to the next question. Yeah. Yeah. Moving back a couple you. of years. I told you I'm an easy interview, man. I mean, I could go, I could go on and on too. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I got a list of questions next. <laughs> Yeah, moving back a couple of years, uh, you won an Eisner Award and a Harvey Award for the character you wrote in 52, Rene Montoya, mm. for, uh, for Half a Life in Gotham Central, which was yeah. a really big deal back then. It's a story that outed Rene Montoya. As yeah, the story was called Half a Life. It was done with Michael Lark. Yeah, it was done with Michael Lark. How big was this back then? Like, did you jump through any hoops in DC or... <laughs> Um, the comics code or I, I, okay. So my understanding is that there was actually internal discussion and fights about it at the time. I was shielded from that. Um, it wasn't until well after the fact that I'd heard there had ever been any argument as to whether or not to do the story in house. But I think there were people in house as, as I later found out who were like, we're not sure about this. Um, the online and community reaction 
was exactly what you'd expect. There were some people who were angry and noisy and pissed off that we were doing this in a comic for kids, uh, to which I said, did you read issue one, the part where Ed freezes a guy alive and then has Mr. Freeze break him into chunks? But, but, but somebody coming out as queer is more problematic? You need to reevaluate your priorities. So there was, there was the normal Strom and Drang and, and, and you know, people throwing fits. And there were a whole lot of people. And, and to this day, there are people who come to me and say that story was so important to me. That story, you know, that, that I found that when I needed it. If nothing else, I'll tell you what Half a Life taught me, and I think taught Michael as well, is that when people talk about representation in comics, um, it, it isn't it isn't a fictional thing. It isn't something that people are making up. It isn't immaterial. Um, to tell stories and put them into the world, where and and to be somebody who cannot see yourself in any story is to be told that you have no story to tell. It's to be told you don't exist. We are creatures of narrative. Um, the ability, you know, the ability to see oneself in, in, in our stories is one of the ways we create our self-esteem and our self-image. So it was, it was important. It was important. It's important. So also, I yeah, yeah I, and I also think honestly, look, I, I I'm pretty sure that when it all is said and done, my obituary is gonna you know read you know Eisner Award winner for the Gotham Central story Half a Life, in which you know Rene Montoya came out, um, and uh, I'm not upset about that at all, mm -hmm. um, but I would ideally like to be able to live old enough so that um, that's actually not the thing I'm remembered for. You know, I've got kids and they kind of look at me and go like, this was ever a thing? This was an issue? You know, and it's like, see, that's that's where I'd like to be. Yeah. We have real we have real things that we can we can be concentrating on. This shouldn't be a thing. You wanna go back and say that like you wanna to get to a point where that kind of story isn't a big deal, but it really yeah. was back then. It was. It still uh, is now, because uh, you know, six years later you won the GLAD award for Batwoman. Yeah, for for the detective run, detective comics run with with J H Williams the third, um, and again it was, yeah, it was another big deal, and it was like okay, I guess it is, you know what we wanted to do with the reinvention of Batwoman, and then we were given very specific marching orders there, was to try to create and and Jim and I worked very hard on this, and we worked very hard. Uh, with the with our editor Michael Seguin to make sure that we built an origin for the character that would survive the test of time and that would never allow for somebody to come along and straight wash her. Mm -hmm. That 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 her her homosexuality was always going to be integral to the character. So that's a really powerful sequence when she removes her ring and puts it on. Thank you. Her I am. Um, yeah, I, I'm very fond of that moment, and I think it is clearly still relevant, sadly. So. Yeah. Um, and when Batwoman was introduced in 2006 in 52, there was still that online um, Sturm and Drum. Yeah. And yeah. it's still kind of happening now with her TV show. Like yeah. I see the comments. Do uh, you think it's getting less, though, or... I think it's always been less. I think that the people who don't like this stuff just shout very, very loud and stomp their feet. And that we have a very, we pay too much attention to the wrong things. You know, comic skate dries up and blows away if we stop feeding it. You know, um, Nazis need to be punched in the mouth. Uh, and hate cannot be tolerated, and it's as simple as that. Trying to engage on some of this stuff, I think, has clearly been demonstrably proven to be a waste of time. And there's a group of people uh, in the world right now, online, uh, and they're a small group, and, you know, they've got 100 screen names, and they've got nothing better to do with their time than 
pick something today that they're angry about. Um, the fact of the matter is, if Batwoman was so problematic, then the CW wouldn't have gone to the lengths they have gone to recast after Ruby left the show and to do a second season. It's because at the end of the day, they're in this to make money. Mm -hmm. Clearly enough, people want to see this. They're making money. It's like the, the main color that these networks are looking for is green. Always. That's always it. So, you know, I, I've always, this is not to diminish any other means of protest or anything, but and a, a, always one of the most effective means of protest is a boycott, right? Yeah. Because you hit them in the wallet and they feel that. And clearly with Batwoman, it's not getting boycott, boycotted. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> or if it is, it's not certainly not affected. It's not affected at all. And there's, there's something else here, too, which is the implication that everybody should like everything, and that's bullshit. It's just not true, right? Your, your choice to like the things you like, you should be able to like, mm -hmm. right? If it's, not, if it's not problematic material, if it's not hurting anybody, then, you know, you can love Rise of Skywalker, and I can hate it, and that's fine. That's Do you not hate Rise of Skywalker? I absolutely do, but um, did you but, like the Last Jedi? Yes, I did. I'm that guy. Okay. Um, but but my point is this, right? That's you want to spend time fighting over that online. We've got real issues that need to be solved right now, uh, and attacking yeah. somebody's pleasure. You know, I'm not going to turn around and tell somebody who loved the movie that they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. They did. Okay. Wasn't for me. I'm one of those guys who has never really seen Star Wars. Okay, well there so you go. When I see people fight about it, I'm like, really? Yeah, <laughs> but 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 in its own way, it's the it, it's the difference between going, hey, who would win in a fight, Superman or Thor, and going, that's a fun game to play. When you start shouting at each other about it, you've lost the plot. Oh man, yeah. You know what I mean? That's so. that's what's killed me from a lot of the forums when, when they start talking about that stuff. It used to be fun, but now it's like Thor did yeah. this in this issue and Superman did this yeah. in this issue. I'm like, well, and you're just, you know, you, and it's not even the you're wrong. It's the you're wrong and therefore an inferior <laughs> and worthless human being and I'm going to dox you. It's like, okay, guys, they're comics. Relax. <laughs> You think a lot of uh, a lot of people like get way too into this hobby? Says the guy who's oh, making a channel out of it. Look and and says the guy who and you can see my office behind me on the video here. Yeah. I mean, you know, there there's figures everywhere and so on. I make my living at this. I love this stuff, and I love being able to do the deep dives. I just don't have the patience for. I I don't have the patience. For I don't have the patience for the lack of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. All right. Like I'm more than happy to argue with somebody about why I think Wonder Woman is the greatest of every, any superhero ever created. Right. And I am more than happy to have that or, 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 you know, anything along those lines and to have fun with it. It's the moment that it's not fun. It's the moment that it becomes, no, no, I have to win. <laughs> I need you to say that, you know, I, I, I need you to say that you're wrong and I'm right. It's like, okay, this is not the same thing as arguing about whether or not it's appropriate to be putting children in camps. Absolutely. And, and let's get our priorities clear. You know, it, it is worth remembering that fan is short for fanatic. Um, but fandoms are great things. I'm not down on fandoms and fans do incredible things. And I'll give you another Star Wars example, right? The 501st Stormtrooper Legion is a legion of fans. That is an entirely fan-based community. It is self-created. It is global. And they do good works all around the world, right? That's the power of a fandom. And that's by no means unique. I mean, that is by no means a unique use of that passion. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think 
Yeah. I mean, look, I, I have had a very successful career because of fans. Uh, and, and I am grateful for their love of these characters because that's what the fandom is about. Right. Um, so, yeah. Why is Wonder Woman the greatest superhero you've ever written? <laughs> Look, I, I, I love Diana. I think she is so beautifully nuanced and, and remarkably difficult to write well. Like I've Superman's, heard that said about her a lot. Superman's hard to do well. Batman's easy. You know, Batman is not difficult to write, okay? I mean, really, there are very few ways to screw up Batman. I mean, you could do funny Batman. Uh, well, even, even that. Batman. I mean, our, our, our modern Batman interpretation is he's a badass and he's the best at everything and he's super smart and he's always mean, right? There you go. I give you a mean, angry Batman who doesn't talk a lot. A lot. Everybody's going to be happy. All right. Uh, Superman's much harder because Superman is about Superman is much more driven by illuminating his interior life in an exterior way. And then Diana becomes even more complicated than that because Diana is in many ways even more, well, not in, for obvious reasons, if you think about it, is far more alien than Superman is. Because at the heart of Superman is an alien who wants to be, he wants to be human, mm -hmm. right? The, the guy in the costume is always Clark Kent, right? He's he, raised in the Midwest. Exactly. And he wants the best and he want, and, and what he wants to do is be able to, to be amongst these people and enjoy them. And for Diana, she's coming from, oh, a totally different place. She is the absolute stranger in a strange land. And she gets to play in both mythology and reality and reality in quotes here being the DC universe. So it is a, a fluid reality and, and not beholden by many of our laws, but still a reality. Um, the character has wonderful pathos when done properly, and I always love pathos. Mm -hmm. um, I think pathos is how you get the best stories. Um, you can go for, like I said, there are a thousand stories to tell about Diana. Um, and again, if you really think about who she is and where she's from and how she sees the world, and where her gaps are, the things she doesn't know and doesn't understand, and the things she does know and absolutely understands, there's a lot of mileage there. There's a lot of mileage there. Um, but yeah, I adore her. I adore that character. You wrote what I think is the perfect Wonder Woman story in the Hikatea. Oh, thank and you. You basically just said that what people want is an unbeatable Batman. Mm -hmm. So, and I've noticed, like, in the past 20 years, Batman has been super protected by DC. Did, did yeah. that particular scene have, like, did you, did you jump through hoops for that particular book? No, I think people were just tickled when uh, J.G. Jones put in that cover sketch with the boot on his head. And they were like, that's just such an awesome image. And I remember saying to him, no, this is what I want. I want her boot on his head, you know. Um, I, I love I I love juxtaposing those two. I think juxtaposing Diana and Bruce is you you get fantastic results there, just because they are so different and they're so alike in some ways. Yeah, um, they're both you know, royalty. I, well, and and I think you know Batman always. Looked, I've said this elsewhere. I think Batman always looks at Wonder Woman and goes, "I wish I could be you." Right. I, I wish I had your heart and your faith and your ability to love the world. Yeah, I don't think he looks at Superman and goes, I want to be you. He looks at Diana and he goes, God, I, I wish I could be that. And I can't. And I think Diana looks at him and goes, you are the boy my mother warned me about in every way, you know. And, um, and I think their friendship is a genuine friendship. I think it's a true one. Uh, a lot of people ship those two. Yeah, yeah, and that's fine. I can see it. I absolutely can see it. And it also, with a juxtaposition of them, I realized that you work in basically in two genres. Mm -hmm. You work, you came in 
uh, with this wave of crime writers, Ed Brubaker, yeah. um, Brian Bendis, uh, and then you move into, into myth and stuff as well, like, like with the old guard, which by yeah. the way, congratulations. It's one of Thank the you. best Netflix. Uh, it's one of the 10 most popular Netflix movies. Now. Yeah. 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 Uh, and the movie is doing very well, um, which is wonderful. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I think I, I've done a lot of interviews because of the movie and, and the genre keeps coming up and I just don't, I never approach my work at this point. At the beginning I did, at the beginning I was like, I'm going to write private eye novels. That was the genre mm -hmm. that I wanted to work in. And then I sort of went, I'm very interested in espionage. That's a genre I'm interested in. But... You know, for the last 15 years or so, when I sit down to write a story, when I have the idea for the story, it's never a question of what genre am I writing in? It's like, what is this story? And then after the fact, somebody always comes along and will say, oh, you wrote a horror story. And I go, did I? I guess. You know, uh, you know the old guard is being called a superhero movie in some quarters. And to me, it never was. It's just not. No, it's not a superhero no. movie. I, I, to me, it is a fantasy. And it's, uh, you know, and, and we call it in the comic, we call it a fairy tale. We say this is a fairy tale of blood and bullets, you know? Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm really bad at this point at genre labeling myself. I think I come back to, um, I think I tend to come back to certain types of relationships and certain questions within it. I've always been fascinated by nature versus nurture. Mm -hmm. um, that's what Lazarus is about in large part. That's what black magic is about in large part. Arguably, that's what half a life was about in a way. Um, it's certainly at the core of who Diana is. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm always trying to tease that one out. So I'm trying to figure that out. Do you think you think Diana should be the center of the DC movie universe? Um, I certainly think that the Wonder Woman movies have been the uh, most successful. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen 84 yet, so I can't say. But I certainly think Wonder Woman, Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman was the best superhero movie they've done. Moving on from Wonder Woman, uh, there is a character that, you know, is also on TV now, but it's kind of the exact opposite. She's kind of a klutz. She's not uh, perfect. We're talking about Dex. Yeah. We're talking about Dex. So, so what leads to a character? Because usually when there's a crime book out, you know, it's a hard-boiled crime book, and she's really funny. <laughs> well, I mean, Dex comes, Dex is a private eye, and she was built with malice aforethought. I did scholarly work on on the private investigator when I was in college. So, Dex was very carefully built. And, you know, the, the PI is a vehicle for social commentary. Um, the PI is representative of their moment. And in the U.S., you look at things like the Rockford Files from the 70s and Magnum PI in the 80s. These are characters that are reflective of their moment of creation. They are saying something about the world around them. But I think one of the reasons that Dex has any resonance is that she is reflective of 2020. <clears throat> you know, she doesn't know if she's going or, com or coming. The whole thing is a dumpster fire. She's trying to do her best. Her heart is in the right place. You know, she cares deeply for her family. Um, but yeah, everything around her is a hot mess and she can barely dress herself in the morning. So... You know, if that's not the political, if that's not the state of the world right now, I don't know another way to put it. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about a private eye story and the nice thing about Dex is that, you know, at the end of the day, Dex is going to do the right thing, no matter how screwed up she is. And at the end of the day, you know that she's going to, she is going to fix a wrong. And it may be a small one, but that's the pleasure of the story is that, you know, at the end, the detective will have made something that went wrong right again, as best as they could. Um, and God knows we need that right now. Dex is kind of emblematic of something that you wrote back in 2011. Um, and also just the fact that you write, you do write like a lot of crime and, uh, you know, realistic, uh, not realistic, but, you know, grounded yeah. stuff. 
but you also write Wonder Woman. Uh, when the Captain America movie came out, you wrote a whole thing on your blog about how cynicism is not uh, you know, equal to realism. And yeah. I was surprised to read that from, from you because that's not how I know your work. But there is a oh. hopeful tinge in, in all of your work. Well, look, I, 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 maybe it's the result of getting older, but, um, well, I think that, you know, grim and gritty is shorthand for serious, and it's an incorrect short, shorthand, you know. If I show you this guy's head coming off, that means we're making something important and serious. No, it's not. I feel mean. like there's a specific writer you're meant you you want to mention here. No, no, I, I I'm just I'm I'm <laughs> talking in in broad terms, right? This whole idea that you know, this whole idea that well we you know it's for kids, it's childish. It's like, man, you know, Superman the movie is a brilliant movie. It's a wonderful film. It is an uplifting film and a positive film. And to look at that movie and then decide that it's, it, 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 it has no place. That movie was released in 78. And that that has no place in 2020, that's bullshit. I mean, that's just, it's wrong. And our heroes are supposed to be aspirational. These are supposed to be good people. They're supposed to be good people. And one of the problems I think we have culturally is that we've abandoned that. We don't have heroes who are good guys. We've, we've made them all morally compromised. We've made them all problematic to such an extent that they make a Joker movie where the Joker's the protagonist. He's your hero. And I think that's wrong. I think that there's a, 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 and it has nothing to do with the quality of the film. I think there's a question that you have to engage as to what the message you want to put out in the world is with these tools. There's a perfectly valid place to tell the story of Taxi Driver, it's called Taxi Driver, right? And it's the 1970s. And, and, and needing to then reskin it as a superhero movie, it's like, well, I'm not, you know, that goes to a whole other places that I think there's a, there's a better discussion to, uh, to have. Yeah. And one of the joys of, of Captain America, and in particular, you know, Captain America Winter Soldier, which is arguably the best Superman movie ever made, Oh, wow. um, Superman movie ever made. Yeah, no, I chose those words very yeah. carefully. Um, you know, you can't look at the Evans portrayal of Captain America and ever, he is always himself at his best. And man, I would much prefer to carry that forward than, you know, carry forward a superhero who slips and loses their temper and kills somebody because they couldn't come up with a better solution. I, I think that that's bullshit. I just, I don't accept it. And I apologize because that's the third time I've used that particular word, but you can tell we're, we're hitting a nerve there. So it's okay. I, anyway. the, the only one I'd bleep out is the F word. All right. Well then I won't use it. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, just when you were talking about the Joker, I was shaking my head. I think it's a, a technically excellent film, but sure. it's just... One has to wonder, like I say, I, I think that the, the decision to make that movie is, you know, you've got you've to ask why you're putting that in, out into the world. That's and the answer is yeah. to make money. You know, the answer is to make money. But, yeah. Yeah, when people when people talk to me about how realistic that movie is, and I'm like, you mean when he's playing that's life during the talk show to emphasize that this is realistic? Yeah, it's, it's well, and 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 that's another problem, right? It, you know, this whole thing of going, oh, it's got to be realistic. It's like, guys, you know what you're getting into when you sit down in the theater. They're on the poster. If your problem with Superman is that he's not realistic, you need to unpack that a little further. What's not realistic about it? That somebody with those powers would be that good? That's not a problem with the character. That's a problem with you and, your, and, and how you deal with the world. That you cannot, for two hours and 10 minutes, suspend your disbelief yeah. for long enough to think that actually somebody could be that good, could be that well-intentioned, 
you can't get there, that's not a problem with Superman. I agree. My, so. my go-to answer when somebody tells me something like that is like, what neighborhood do you live in? You should yeah. move. Yeah. It's just, and it's sad to me that the idea, you know, that that's off-putting, that, that people are so cool or cynical or ironic. It's like, nobody would be that good. And it's like, well, that's really sad. You only want fiction that reinforces your worldview that doesn't tell you that there's a better way. You must have hated original series Star Trek. You know what I mean? Oh man, yeah. And, and, you know, it's 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 you 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 don't have a place for any of these stories. Okay, that's fine. Man, you, I, I'm I'm sorry. That do you sucks. Think, do you think if the internet were around back when original series Star Trek came out, there'd be Star Trek Gate or Sci Fi Gate? I don't know. Um, I am not a fan of social media. I think social media is, is the greatest evil of, of the modern world. Um, it abs I don't think that there's anything, the, the, the little good that people can point to it having done does not outweigh the grotesque amount of evil that has been done with it and by it. Um, I noticed you did get off of social media. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on Instagram and that's it. And I'm on Instagram because even though it belongs to the loathsome, evil, hated Facebook, yeah. um, it limits to an extent um, the data mining they can do on me and the interactions. But I hate Twitter. I yeah. hate Twitter. And I hate Twitter's irresponsibility and abdication. I am not a fan of Google for doing the same thing, especially YouTube. And you know, and, uh, and Facebook goes without saying, and these aren't issues of freedom of expression. These aren't issues of freedom of speech. And these aren't issues of technology. We know for a fact they could solve all these problems. They don't because they want the money that comes from having people angry and clicking quickly. That's what they want. Yeah. I got some things to say about that off the record later. <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to close this off, would you mind if I mentioned some of the collaborators you've worked with and you tell me your sure. favorite thing about working with them? Okay. Okay. Steve Lieber from Whiteout. Oh, man. Um, God, Steve, there's nothing he can draw. And I mean, nothing he can't draw. There are artists, you know, for instance, Michael Lark works works heavily from reference. He builds models and, and he works from them. And he does a beautiful job. Lieber, you can basically say, I need 400 horses charging down the hill and he'll draw it. And the thing that's fabulous about Steve on top of the amazing storytelling chops he has as a graphic artist, he's funny as hell. And it's only been in sort of the later stages of his career now that people get to see the funny. Yeah. But, you know, half of the funny of Jimmy Olsen is Matt. The other half is Steve. So, yeah. Next collaborator. Uh, uh, Leandro Lightning Fernandez us. from the old guard. Um, I'll tell you the greatest thing in the world right now is being on this movie journey with him. Okay. And I, I, I had played in the feature film world before and watching him... All of this is new and his eyes are so big and he never, ever, ever, ever for one instant has taken it for granted. And his joy is so infectious and so wonderful. And, you know, I mean, you're listing collaborators that I love. You're, you're listing artists that I think are fabulous. But, yeah, I'm never going to forget Leo on set for the old guard you know yeah what's it what's it like by the way having three adaptations of your work coming out all at the same time like uh weird <laughs> just how, weird how much control do you give up and is that okay? like you know how does that sit with you well i mean i did the screenplay for the old guard so i was pretty intimately involved Mm -hmm. um, and with Stumptown, you know, I entered into the process knowing that I wasn't making the show, that I'm there as a consultant and they can leverage me as and how they want to, but there's no obligation. It's one of the things we've agreed to. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's weird, you know, uh, the joke around the house is it only took 25 years to become an overnight success. Shrug. <laughs> so. Matthew Southworth from Stumptown. Um, Wow, he was a 
he is an interesting guy to work with. Um, he has a filmmaker's eye. Yeah, you we know? see that. Yeah, and that filmmaker's eye, uh, especially you know in those early issues before Justin Greenwood took over the book, really turned into that noir aspect of the book. Because I wasn't really writing noir, but he was drawing it, and I think it gave us a beautiful, you know, we ended up with something really glorious. Oh, that's why it was what it was. Because I was saying that when you see something noir, usually it's a super hard-boiled protagonist, but you weren't writing noir. I wasn't really that interested in noir. I think, uh, I think Ed Brubaker's got noir pretty much covered, so... I mean, you both, does, you both and, do And he does well. it better than me. No, I think Ed does it much better than me, so... But thank you. Um, okay, I don't want to forget this guy again, Mike Perkins. Yeah, okay, so Perks is just a delight. And one of the things about Perks, it's, it's kind of like Leo in a way. He's just, he's so happy to be able to be making comics. Um, but he's just, I mean, there are three DPSs in Lois Lane issue 10. And they follow one after the other. And the script for those was, so this is what we're trying to convey. And this is the way we see it conveyed normally. And I don't want to do it that way. Mm. Um, so here are some things. And also here are a bunch of physics equations that I want in the background. Right? <laughs> I want the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And, you know, I, I want, you know, the, just, you know, Planck's theorem and so on. You know, like the solving for the Planck constant and things like that. And he and I got on the phone, you know, and, and, and I was sending him YouTube links. And so on. take a look at this, take a look at this. And when those pages came in, I couldn't stop giggling. And he approaches everything like that. He is so professional and so hardworking. And yet when people are as diligent and disciplined as Perkins is, they tend to be kind of dour and he's not like the guy laughs and smiles and is he's just happy to have the job and then he kills it on it all the time so yeah it's like super super underrated yeah i'm gonna name these next two as a pair uh liam sharp and nicholas scott um well nick th that's an odd pairing um nick and I have known each other a really long time. And we do black magic together yeah. as well as some of the Wonder Woman stuff. And she's one of my dearest friends. Uh, I wanted as to a, juxtapose her. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and Liam, you know, I hadn't met until I came on to Wonder Woman uh, for, for Rebirth. And he and I got along, I think, better than either of us thought we would. I know for a fact that when he got that first call from me, he was like, I don't know what this is going to be like. And man, Liam is just, he, he, this is, I don't think I have a better way to put it. He, he is the front man for a metal band. You know what I mean? I see what you mean. I'm friends and, with him on Facebook, so I can, I can see his. Uh... No, he's, and he's a delight. And again, another one of these guys who is, just so big hearted and so wonderful, you know. You kind of need that to work on Wonder Woman. I think so, you do, yeah. Um, Rick Burchett. Okay, so you got to understand Rick is next to Libra, the guy I've known in the business longest, really. Okay. We, we were introduced by Denny, and um, we are brothers by a different mother, separated by about 20 years. <laughs> Uh, he gets all my references and I get all his and I love working with him. You got uh, both Batman and the pirate Lady Saber. Uh, right. And uh, actually he and I are working on something right now. So, yeah. You want to talk about that or not yet? Can't yet. Can't okay. yet. But we I, are working on something. Is there a plan to continue Lady Saber? I don't think so, which is unfortunate. And we've got to figure out how to square what we, I, I still want to make right to our Kickstarter backers. But the fact of the matter is, even after the Kickstarter, which was wildly successful, I think we ended up with $3,000 we could split between the three of us uh, uh, who worked on it. And that was after, you know, 18 months of Lady Sabering. Um, and there are bills we got to pay. 
Yeah. And, and turning it into a pay site is not an option. Um, so, you know, I would love us to be able to sort of find a way to close it out. And, and, and Rick and I have talked about some of the options there, but uh, I am hoping that in this next thing we do, we'll be able to make right for those, for those backers who backed at a higher level and were, you know, wanted to be characters or named or appeared that we'll be able to do that and make sure they get their due. So, uh, you already said Michael Lark could draw anything. Yeah. Draw anything else? Well, I said Steve, Steve Lieber can draw anything. Oh, wait, no, Michael Lark needs references. My, well, Michael Lark works from references. Yeah. There's a difference. Um, I look, you know, I mean, I love working with Mike. I mean, you're talking about all these guys and, and gals that I am very close to. We, you know, there is no, there is no Lazarus without Michael. Yeah. Uh, and the thing I think I love most about Michael is he's constantly challenging me. And that's just the nature of his personality. He's just always poking me and being like, eh, is that right? Can you do that better? Um, and that would be a pain if I didn't know that he does it to himself every day. Uh, oh yeah. It's the, uh, it's the Michael Jordan form of, uh, teamwork. Yeah. Um, just a couple more names. Uh, Keith Giffen. Uh, crankiest old man in comics <laughs> and a freaking genius. He's great. Next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to close off uh, with no bias whatsoever to everyone who can see my Promethea action figure over there. Uh, Jim. J.H. Williams. The third. Yeah. Jim. Um, one of the most challenging uh, artists I've ever worked with because he is an astonishing craftsperson. Um, you know, I, 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 I had to learn an entirely new scripting style to write for him. Um, and it's funny, you look at those old Batwoman scripts, you know, and, and, and the scripts are actually rather thin um, because a lot of the panel descriptions are, okay, so pages six and seven. Jim, this is that thing we talked about on the phone. Like there were literally 12 to 18 hours of conversations before I would even write a script. Just talking about the movement of the story and him telling me what he imagined the visuals would be and me being like, I don't know how to script that. He'd be like, it's okay. Just, you know, say that it's the thing. But yeah, every, almost every issue of, of, of that Batwoman run, you know, I wrote with the exception of, I think, maybe the first in deep conversation with him. Um, it was really, at that time, one of the first times I'd ever had a collaboration that deep. You got uh, multiple styles going on in that Batwoman run, too. Yeah. Yeah. But again, very deliberately, so. Um, anything you want to plug as we go off? There's a movie. I think people should see it. I think it's a really good movie. It's called The Old Guard. Star Charlize Theron and Kiki Lane. It's I think on people Netflix. have seen it by the by the time this goes. So. Um, I'm I'm very <laughs> proud of it. Um, yeah. Black Magic. It's a really is good movie. I watched it the other day. Yeah. It's um, one of the top ten here in the Philippines as well. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Um, uh, Black Magic is coming back, I believe, this month uh, with issue twelve. Okay. Um, and Lazarus Risen issue five is either going to be late August or early September right now. So, you know, awesome. we're still making comics. We're still doing it. Just going to keep going. Yeah. Can't Thank stop. Won't stop. Thank you. This has been the Comics Cube talking to Greg Rucka. It was my pleasure. Thank you.